we are going to we are about to start with the next session. So um, when I I started working for the cute company two years ago, and one of the key questions which have always been asked to me was what is the difference between cute open source and cute commercial? And since we switched to a new version of uh, open source, which is called GPL or LGPL version three which was last year in May, in May, we have had many inquiries about the differences between version 2.1 and version 3. And that is why I'm very happy to announce our next speaker, whose name is Paul Criswell. Paul is an independent general counsel. He specializes on patent laws. He has been working for 35 years with diverse technology companies. He has helped them on many patent topics, and that's why he's one, one of the experts in this area. And he flew all the way from Boston as well, so I'm very happy to welcome him today. Are we ready? Almost. How many, how many of you use open source currently, if I may ask? Everyone. Okay. <laughs> I thought so, but I just wanted to have the confirmation. Okay, so uh, help me welcome Paul Criswell. Thank you. So, three o'clock on the last day of the conference, and you're here to listen to the lawyer. <laughs> You people are dedicated. Either that or you're here with somebody more senior from, from your company and you just couldn't bring yourself to say, hey, let's go have a beer instead of listening to, uh, to, to this guy. So thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for, for being here. Um, I'm here to talk about the evolution of the GPL license. And the reason that I'm doing this is that, uh, as many of you know, when uh, Qt released version 5.7, Qt moved from the LGPL 2.1 version license to, Q to the LGPL version 3 license for, for many, or if not most, of, of its open source products. Um, LGPL 3 is a complete rewrite of the LGPL license. And as a developer, as a product manager, as a company that's offering these products, you need to know, is it possible? Is it feasible? Is it practical to comply with your obligations under the LGPL license? Now, I have to tell you, when Qt started to, to determine whether we, it should evolve and, and, and create a, a, a different license for its, uh, for its open source products, we had a lot of choices. And what I advocated, actually, was something that is referred to as the chicken dance uh, license. And if we had licensed this under the chicken dance license, for every thousand units that are distributed, at least half of the employees at the company have to listen to the chicken dance for at least two minutes. And for every 20,000 versions that are created, one person from your company has to be recorded doing the full chicken dance and then perfect language from these open source licenses. The dance featured in the video must be based upon the instructions on how to perform the chicken dance that you should have received with this software. So if you didn't get those instructions, then it is a license violation. Let me, uh, let, let me start with, with, with a few basics here. And, and I'm sure that most of you know this uh, at least as well as I do, if not better than I do. But you'll understand uh, as I'm going forward that this is sort of setting the table for what I'm going to, to talk about later. The GPL and the LGPL version 2 
or in many ways a very, very simple software licensing concept. It was reciprocal source code. I will provide you with, uh, with my source code, but in exchange for that, if you modify it, you have to provide me with your source code back. If you refuse, and it's a, it's a copyright license, so if you refuse to provide me with your source code, then you no longer have any right to use this software. And then, of course, what came up is that there were all sorts of these boundary issues that, uh, that, that people had. What is it that's going to, to make this part of an open source module? What can be separate from it? And you'll remember, if you go back to the 1990s, Steve Ballmer from, from Microsoft was famously telling people, if you use any open source, the sky is going to fall, the world will come to an end. Turns out he was spectacularly wrong, and a couple years later, he retired filthy rich. So today, I'm here to tell you about what's new about LGPL version 3. I'm going to try to be very practical and, 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 and uh, honest about what it is that's different. I'm not going to tell you that the sky is falling. Hopefully, I am not going to be spectacularly wrong. And I'm still working on the retiring filthy rich part. I'm stuck. <laughs> Hopefully, that's, that's all going to, to come at, at, at some point. And then there's all sorts of issues about who enforces this license? Who is it that can sue? Who is it that can make you do whatever it is you're supposed to do to comply with the, the license agreement? And, and, and if you don't, what happens? So remember this simple concept with regard to, to the, the GPL version 2. And libraries, which were the subject of the LGPL version 2, were always a very special case because they are designed in many ways to act, you know, to, to service other software. It was important to create much more defined boundaries. So under N L LGPL, you can use open source libraries, you can use them with your proprietary application. And as long as you comply with certain linking and interface uh, specifications or, or methods, you were safe, you were completely safe. One of the problems is that those standards, those standards with regard to linking and interface, those were really sort of uh, community methods of doing business. You can't point to the language of the LGPL license and say, this is exactly, you know, this tells you how you can interface with these and, and be safe with your proprietary application. So, the open source software, of course, has been successful beyond anybody's uh, imagination, if you will. The, um, I'm sorry, so, so not only has free and open software become common, it's become ubiquitous, it's, it's gone everywhere. Now, as a result of that, proprietary vendors are using it everywhere and Remember Adam Smith, the, the godfather of capitalism, is famous for saying, whenever two business people get together, the talk immediately turns to a conspiracy against the public interest. And so, people who provide proprietary products, which I'm going to guess is everybody in this room, have tried to figure out ways to make sure that they could keep their product as proprietary as possible so that they didn't have to comply except to the extent necessary with a lot of the aspects of, of the open source software. I think you can understand the GPL3 and the LGPL3 best by thinking of them as the next generation which is intended to address a lot of the loopholes, a lot of the workarounds that people came up with to get around some of their obligations in the GPL2 or the LGPL2. So in my mind, and what I'm gonna talk about here, the four most important developments in the LGPL3 license, what's different in them from the LGPL2.1. Anti-TiVoization, the redefinition or restructuring of the language with regard to boundaries between open source software and proprietary software, license compatibility, and some of the anti-software patent issues that you see in, uh, in the new versions of, of the licenses. The basic structure, LGPL2 
2.1 is a standalone license agreement. It is intended to have everything that you need within the four walls of, of that agreement. The LGPL3 license is an amendment or it's an annex to the GPL3 license. It is part of the GPL3 license. The GPL3 license gives you certain permissions. You have the right to do X, Y, and Z if you comply with the license. The LGPL version 3 provides you with a few other things that you can do if you comply with all of those provisions. And those are called the additional provisions that, that uh, people speak about with regard to the, to the LGPL license. But what you have to keep in mind is, except as, as is expressly stated in the LGPL3 license, the terms of the GPL3 license apply to everything that you're doing if you apply the LGPL3 license. Most, the most glaring exception, the one that's the, that's the most express in the LGPL, all the things with regard to uh, the, the DRM protection, that doesn't apply to anything that is licensed under the LGPL license. So that's, that's the, the clearest example of something from the GPL3 that, that doesn't apply. So TiVoization, um, as you'll recall, what happened, and, and TiVo was, was the best example of this, people were creating devices, they were using free and open source software, they were allowing people to modify that software all they wanted, but then when you tried to reinstall it in the device, the device had mechanisms built into it that said, if you've modified this software in any way, I'm gonna shut myself down, and good luck with your, with your modified software at, at that point. The LGPL3 license prohibits, the, prohibits TiVoization. It says that if you create a device such as this, and not only do you have to provide people the mechanism, the, the ability to be able to modify the software that runs that, but you also have to provide them with installation structs, instructions and methods that allows them to put that back into your device so that it works. And, and so that's, that's what's very, very different about the LGPL3 license. It has to have installation means and the instructions and, and it has to work. Now, the ant, a lot of people will particularly if you're making medical devices, and I don't know if, if all of you are, but, but, but clearly some of you are, a lot of people will dismiss this because they'll say, this only applies to consumer products, so we don't have to worry about it. It's if you're making an intelligent toaster or if you're making a digital video recorder, that's where you have to, to worry about that. You don't have to worry about it if, you are, uh, if you're making a, a, a heart-lung machine or, or something like that. But the actual language in the LGPL3 license talks about user products. It doesn't talk just about consumer products. User products is defined as two things. Number one, it is a consumer product. And the definition of consumer product was intentionally modeled after a, 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 a statute in the United States called the Magnuson-Moss Consumer Warranties Act but it has a definition of consumer product and it's quite, uh, quite extensive. It says in that act and it says in the license agreement that if there's any doubt about the classification of something that the doubt should be resolved in favor of something being considered to be a consumer product. So if you've got something that's in a gray area then the doubt is supposed to be resolved such that it's covered under this license agreement. And so if you folks are making medical devices, let me, uh, let me ask you what seems to be one of the most personal products that you could pro ever, ever have, and that is an implantable medical device. Isn't that something that is, is uh, uh, intended purely for personal use? And wouldn't that seem then absolutely to be something that is, that is intended for personal family or household purposes and should be a consumer product? So if you read some of the commentary that the Free Software Foundation 
put out when, uh, you know, surrounding the, the, the new version 3 license, even they admit, nah, we're not going to push this quite that far. But let, me, let me read you what, what they did say in some of the commentary and, and see if you find this as, as chilling as I do. In any case, it will probably be necessary to convince medical device regulators to allow user-modifiable implantable medical devices. We plan to begin a campaign to address this issue. I don't think that's a good idea. And I'm not going to modify my pacemaker. Maybe, maybe, maybe somebody out there will decide that, that, that they want to, uh, to, to do that. But let me tell you, the other part of it, besides consumer products, anything that's designed or sold for incorporation into a dwelling is also considered to be a user product and therefore covered by the anti-TiVoization uh, provisions. So if you're making a medical device, you have to figure out what does incorporation mean and what does a dwelling mean. So if you're selling a, a giant scanner that's going to go in a hospital operating room, I think we can probably all agree that that's not being installed in the hospital and it's not, uh, and a hospital is not a dwelling. But what about a nursing home? What if you're building a defibrillator and it's hardwired into the, you know, into the, the building system of the nursing home? What if, it, what if you're, you're doing uh, uh, you know, diabetes uh, testing or infusion systems and they're built into the extended care facility that is an annex to the hospital or something like that? Seems to me that you could consider that to be incorporation into a dwelling. And I'm not, again, I'm not up here to, to try to, to, to scare you into anything, but I will tell you that you've got to consider definitions like that when you decide what you're going to do with your product and you have to consider what's going to be the extent of the market that you will be able to address with your product if you decide I'm not going to worry about this because I'm not building something that's considered to be a, a user product. Boundary issues. So when they wrote the LGPL3, they did something that for me as a lawyer drives me absolutely crazy. Now I'm going to stop here for a second because I know what's going through every one of your minds right now. Every one of you is thinking, well, if they're driving the lawyers crazy, they must be doing something right. <laughs> let, let, me, let me just for a second plead on behalf of, of my profession. The one thing we really like is we like clarity. We like to be able to tell our clients what, what they can do and what they can't do. So the LGPL 2.1 simply says in order that a program that's designed to work with the library by being compiled or linked with it is not a derivative work and falls outside of the scope. And then the next paragraph just in line says, if an object file uses only numerical parameters, data structures, layouts, assessors, et cetera, less than 10 lines in length, then, then use of that object file is unrestricted, regardless of whether it is a derivative work. Fair, fairly simple sentence structure. In the LGPL3, they defined a combined work as something that is a work com produced by combining or linking the application. Section 4 provides for methods, allowable methods for conveying a combined work. And then section three says that if the application simply incorporates the numerical structures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then, it's, uh, th then it can be um, distributed without restriction. Usually the maximum of legal cons construction is if you say something differently from one contract to another, it's supposed to mean something different. I have no idea whether this is intended to mean something different or whether it's intended to mean something that is exactly the same. If you want to have fun with your legal department, take this to them and ask them to explain it to you. <laughs> license compatibility. Um, 
And here I'm not talking about boundary issues. Here what I'm talking about is situations where you are genuinely combining code <laughs> together into one file. You know it's all going to be considered to be one file and has to be licensed under the appropriate open source licenses. Well, when you do that, all the different ingredients to it have to be combined together, have to have compatible license agreements. So you can't combine software that has a license agreement that says you can only use this software in the daytime with another piece of software that says you can only use this in, in, in the nighttime. They have to be compatible. Most GPL, so, so LGPL version 3 software is not compatible with GPL version 2 software. You can't have the two of them together in the same software module, the same combined software. Now, the way that's usually solved is that most GPL2 software is licensed under a provision that says G GPL2 or later, meaning that you can solve this problem by taking your GPL3 2 software that you're putting into, into this pot, you can license it under GPL3 and you've solved the incompatibility problem. Not all GPL2 software is licensed that way. Uh, among certain people, Linus Torvalds licenses many, much of his code under an LGPL2 only license restriction. So if you're going to be combining software and you're going to be using GPL2 software as, as part of what you're putting together, you're going to have to go back and look at the license files and make sure that, they, that those are compatible with, with one another. Software patents. This is addressed in much, much more detail in the GPL version 3. And this, by the way, is in the GPL 3 license not the LGPL3 license. And let me read to you again from the Free Software Foundation what they say about software patents so that you'll understand where they're coming from. Software patenting is harmful and unjust policy and should be abolished. So they're fundamentally doing what they can through their license agreements to eliminate the effect of patents that cover software. So LGPL version 2 and GPL version 2 had what are called an implied license. Version 2.1 simply said you may not impose any further restrictions on the recipients, an implied software license. GPL 3 goes into much more detail. There is an express patent license in there. There is a restriction with regard to single transaction patent licenses, and there's something having to do with discriminatory patent licenses. And let me just read to you the, the, the language with regard to discriminatory licenses. A patent license is discriminatory if it does not include within the scope of its coverage, prohibits the exercise of, or is conditioned upon the non-exercise of, one or more of the rights that are specifically granted under this license. You may not convey a covered work if you are a party to an arrangement with a third party that is in the business of distributing software under which you made payments to the third party based on the extent of your activity of conveying the work and under which the third party grants to any parties who would receive a covered work from you a discriminatory patent license, A, in connection with the copies of the covered work conveyed to you by you or copies made from those copies or B, into arrangement that uh, primarily for and in connection with the specific products or compilations that contain the covered work unless you entered into that arrangement or that patent license was granted prior to 28 March 2007. And if any of you understand what I just read, you are a better person than, than I am. What, where this really comes into effect where this really it causes some complexity to you is if you are dealing with third party patents. If you are licensed, if you're entering into a cross license agreement with, with somebody, and let's say you're saying that they can manufacture and sell their products within the United States and you can manufacture and sell your products within Europe, it's not clear that you can do that just with a patent license if those patents cover in any way the use of the open source software. 
If you are building an infusion pump and somebody else is building a cardiac pump and you're trying to cross-license one another and limit one another to cardiac pumps here, infusion pumps here, and the patents cover the, uh, co cover the, the use of, of the open source software, again, not something that you can do. And think about this. This is difficult enough or complex enough if this is a friendly transaction that you're doing. Imagine if you are doing it in the context of settlement of a patent infringement lawsuit between two parties. Then it becomes extraordinarily difficult. Consequences of, of the violation. So I told you that, that I wasn't going to try to, to, to scare you with anything, but you know, I get one scary slide, right? It's almost Thanksgiving. <laughs> Violations. So, the old adage is, if you violate the license, a court will order you to publish the source code to all of your proprietary products. No, that's never, to my knowledge, happened and is not a license that under any legal theory that I know would be permitted to happen. However, if you violate your free and open source software license, you no longer have the right to use or distribute that software, and to do so constitutes copyright infringement. This is a statutory violation. It's not a breach of contract. So any of the limitations of liability or that sort of thing that you have in your contract don't protect you if you're guilty of or liable for copyright infringement. On top of that, the statutory remedies are often things like the, the, the copyright owner can get from the infringer all of the profits that the infringer made on the infringing product. That's the, that's the standard copyright infringement uh, method of calculating damages. So you have some, some real issues. You have to be careful that you do this right because the consequences can be pretty scary. And then, okay, let me go back to who sues. I mean, certainly, the entities who own the copyright, those are the people that can go after you and say, you can't use this anymore. That, that's easy enough to, to do. But what about your competitors? Or what about people that seek to build add-on products? Or people that seek to, to, to provide service to, to your product? And this is something that, that used to be a, a huge issue under the antitrust laws in the United States and in Europe partic particularly. Recent case... You probably all have heard of co-kinetics versus um, uh, Panasonic avionics. Somebody brought a suit saying that because you didn't release the source code to your free and open source software, that is an unfair trade practice. And the court needs to force you to do that so that I can get that source code and I can make an add-on product and a compatible product. Again, not telling the defendant, you have to open all of your software, but you absolutely have to open what is open source. That case is winding its way through the courts in the United States. It is an egregious case. I mean, the, the, the defendants are at least accused of doing some really horrible stuff, and those are the types of cases that usually make terrible law, but preliminarily, a court has said, yeah, that sounds like a good, uh, sounds like a good cause of action. Why don't you see if, if, if you can prove that? Regulators, what are regulators going to say, particularly in this era of, of data security, about a device that you are building that has to get regulatory approval that contains free and open source software? And then finally, if you've ever been through an acquisition and had people do due diligence on your use of open source software and your compliance with the license and the vulnerabilities that that might open for this new company that's acquiring you, that's spending millions of dollars to, to acquire this product, you are in for an experience at some point in your life because acquirers will generally want to make sure that there is zero risk of any sort of non-compliance with free and, and open source licenses as they are going forward. So. All food for thought, all things that you have to consider as you're making the decision as to whether you want to move forward to version 3, which you'll, which you'll have to do if you're going to, to, to use Qt software, or if you're going to use a commercial version of, of Qt going forward. Um, so, as I say, food for thought. 
I'd be happy to take questions from anybody. And I thank you very, very much for your consideration.